Today we begin a five-week journey that will end in uh, the beginning of a four-month season of sacrifice that will start on June the 12th through October the 16th that we might secure our foundation of the Temple Christian Center. Last year, during the pandemic, we committed to this same season of sacrifice. And during which time we raised, during the pandemic, above our missions giving, above your other offerings, above your tithing, we raised $40,000 to, to go towards paying off the church mortgage of $356,000. Thus, amen, that's it, amen. Thus leaving us with a balance on our mortgage of $316,000. During this next five weeks, next five week journey leading us to this season of sacrifice, we will look at five different areas in five different subjects. Today, we will start with why do we exist? And I'm going to be ministering. Next Sunday, I've been asked to minister in Denver, Colorado, where I've gone many times to minister uh, at Calvary Apostolic Church. And so Pastor Tim will be ministering the second week of this five-week journey. And we're going, he's going to be ministering about who are we? Who are we at Temple Christian Center? The next week I'll be back and I'll be preaching what do we want to produce from the Temple Christian Center? If we were a business, what would be our product? What do we want our children to look like? What do we want people that we bring on board uh, into this family of God to look like, to act like, to walk like, and to talk like? The next week we'll be talking about where are we going? And I'll be ministering then. And then finally, the fifth week of this five-week journey, a dear friend of mine who hasn't ministered here in a long, long time, pastors in San Antonio, Texas, will be coming. Nathan Scoggins will be ministering, how do we do it? How do we get to where we want to go? At the end of this five-week journey, we will be asking each member of the Temple Christian Center to make a four-month commitment of their time, their talent, and their treasure to bring the vision of TCC into reality. So we're asking you to sacrifice your time, your talent, and your treasure so that the vision that we have for this church will come into reality and secure our foundation for the future. So with that in mind, let's get started on the first leg of this journey by looking at why TCC exists. Why TCC exists. If you will, find your place with me in a very familiar passage, and they'll put it up on the board, Acts, the second chapter, and the 36th verse. Uh, um, and, and I want to use this as our starting point. And you say, well, Brother Sharp, you use this 10 or 11 verses a lot uh, when you're talking about this kind of stuff. This is the reason why is because this is where the church started. No two ways about it. No uh, further discussion needed. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecost, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic. It doesn't matter what Christian faith you call yourself. Everyone agrees that on the day of Pentecost, in the second chapter of Acts is recording this, on the day of Pentecost is when the church was born. And uh, after preaching a message with the 11 apostles, Peter speaking now in the second chapter in the 36th verse, he tells this group of hearers, these Jews in Jerusalem that have gathered there from all over the world, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were convicted in their hearts. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter responded to them, and he said, this is what you need to do. You need to repent, and you need to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. Everybody said the purchase. The remission, the washing away, the purchase of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. And with many other words, 
did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized. And the same day there were about 3,000 added unto them. Everybody say 3,000 people. They went from 120 in their first service. Before the sun set, there were 3,000 more. The next day, there's going to be 5,000. History tells us by the week's end, there were 80,000 people that had been baptized in the name of Jesus and were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And they knew they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they spoke in a language, an unknown tongue, a language they had never learned before as a supernatural sign. Amen. To themselves and to those that were hearing them. They, he said, and there were 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and in and fear. Everybody say reverence. Say reverence. And reverence came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods. And they parted them to all men as every man had need. And here's where I want you to take close notice. Verse number 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I would say that we quite possibly fulfilled the second chapter of Acts at your house yesterday. We were all in that one place in one accord. The accord was to, to, to celebrate Andrea's accomplishments. And we had a feast. And I can certainly say on my part, I ate my meat with gladness. And we all were having a wonderful time. We uh, living for God, and I'm sorry I'm interrupting the scripture. I'm going to get back and finish it in just a second. But living for God is not some dull, drab, bad, horrible, uh, oh, woe is me kind of a thing. Don't try to sell that at TCC, and don't try to talk to me about that. I'm telling you, we should live our life with gladness, uh, and we should live our life with joy, and we should live our life with each other. So they continued with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. So to begin this journey of, uh, uh, that we're going on for five weeks, we ask ourselves, why do we exist as a church? Why are we here? Why do we exist? Why did we come this morning? What's the purpose of being here together? And the very simple answer is found in this passage. It is to create an apostolic environment through the Word of God being preached and worship being proclaimed. So our reason for being here or being in existence and for two or three coming together today, and uh, uh, there's obviously more than two or three, but it's a gathering, a, a, a large gathering of people. Whether you're doing the gathering in the house of the Lord, this what we would call the temple ministry. This is not a temple. This is just a building that we have set aside together on Sundays. But uh, they would go around the outside of the temple. They could not get into the temple, even though the veil was rent and all of those kind of things. That was uh, a whole different thing. So they would gather around Solomon's porch, which is, a, which is a portico that goes all the way around the outside of the temple. And on the first day of the week, they would gather together there, and they would tell the good news of what God had done for them. Anybody ever had God do something for you? I mean, come on. If you got your $42,000 check in the mail, amen. How many people would you want to tell? You'd want the microphone up here next Sunday, amen, and say, hey, pastor, I got a $50,000 check in the mail. I got that. I, because when God starts doing something for us, oh, come on, help me now. I was once blind, but now I see. 
Who is that man? That's the guy that laid by the gate, beautiful all those years, who's been lame from birth. But now I see him running and jumping and leaping and praising God. The reason we come to this house today is to worship God, to begin to lift him up. We exist to come to this place and to begin to praise him and to worship him. And as we send up praise uh, and as we send up worship, then something begins to come down in this place. Uh, he makes his habitation among his praises. Amen. And as people begin to praise him, he begins to dwell in that place. Amen. I had a lady one time, we were in a church service and, and uh, she had never been in an apostolic environment before. That's what we call it here. Uh, uh, and and, and, and uh, just for, if you're listening online or if this is your first time to hear the word apostolic, let me just tell you what that means. That means the apostles taught and practiced and lived a certain way, the apostles of Jesus Christ. So what we do as a Temple Christian Center is we, we strive to live like the apostles did. We try to preach, teach, practice, and live like the apostles did. So when we say apostolic, we're saying we're trying to be like that first uh, century church. And so uh, what we try to create here is an apostolic environment. We know that when Brother and Sister Foster uh, are praying and, and seeking the mind of God for this particular service on Sunday morning, that God lays on their heart uh, spiritual songs and hymns. The Bible said when we sing these spiritual songs and hymns to one another, it encourages one another. Anybody ever been encouraged by a song? Come on, help me preach a little bit. I'll slow down if I need to. I'm trying to get you to the end of this thing, but I'll slow down. I can talk like a text. I is one. I can slow, I can, I can any gear you want. I got high gear, low gear, medium gear. It doesn't matter to me. Amen. But I, I, I'm excited what I'm talking about. I, I've come to church before and, and been down. You say, well, you're the pastor. You've got to preach in a few minutes. Thank God for the song. Because I have gotten my touch that I need and felt the anointing fall on me as we begin to worship God in spiritual songs and hymns. The Bible said when we come together, as we begin to worship Him in spiritual songs, you got your degree last year in music, uh, the ministry of music from the same Bible college. And, 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 and it's a ministry, amen. Your mother and dad has done that successfully here and led us for years. And I don't even, I don't even know what, we, what the songs are, much less how to sing them, amen. But I trust your ministry ministry because you're going to handle the worship when we get here and I'm going to handle the word when we get here but between the two of them we're going to have a divine move of the Holy Ghost uh, when we get together and we start worshiping amen they open the doors the gates uh, into the presence of God for us they open the gates so that when we come in here I don't care how you were feeling before you got here you get a couple of good Holy Ghost apostolic filled songs in you amen and you start singing along with them and the Holy Ghost rushes in here and all of a sudden your heart opens and God is ready to move in your life through the Word of God. Amen. So, the reason we exist is to create this apostolic environment through the Word and worship. Amen. But what I want you to see is that that environment did not just happen on Sunday morning. So hear me and hear me well. And it did not just happen on Wednesday night. You know, Wednesday night is the holiest weeknight of all. I don't know if y'all know that or not. In the third chapter of the first book of Sharp. Wednesday night. Now, Wednesday night's not in the Bible. Probably a southern thing or an American thing. Amen. You know, the apostolic church met on Sundays. Amen. And then uh, we've created this religious tradition that we have midweek Bible study. We come back to, uh, to this house on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and we come back for Bible study because we read that nowhere in the Word of God. It's just something we've done for a long, long time. Now, what did they do in the Word of God? They met in the temple, these group meetings, on Sunday. But then the rest of the week, the Bible said they met house to house. They, they fellowship in these 
uh, these Christian pods, if you will, these Christian cells, if you want to call it a cell ministry, a group ministry, small group ministry, home ministry, house to house ministry, they, they would meet together, amen, and they would come in and, and as they met together, they would do what practically needed to be done, they would eat they, because they were hungry and they would sit down and as they begin to eat their meat with gladness, with joy, they begin to tell each other about the goodness of God and what what God had done for them through that day, through that week. And as they did that, if there was a stranger in their community, according to the Jewish law, they, have, they were required by law to bring that stranger into the hospitality of their home. Yesterday afternoon, uh, RT, which is Tracy, my daughter-in-law's uh, dad, he, he was moving uh, from Corpus Christi up this way and uh, actually moving up to, to Quail where my business is at. It's going to help me with some of the work up there. And so as he was moving up that way, he said, you think I, I might just swing by Temple. It was about an hour out of his way and uh, br get a break and spend the night and go the other seven hours uh, after I'm through because he's pulling his, his RV and, and his trailer up there. And, and I said, okay. And so that's fine. I said, but we've got a graduation at 10 o'clock yesterday. And I said, and after that, uh, we're going over to their house for this big party, this feast. He goes, oh, I don't want to interrupt anything. I said, interrupt? You can't interrupt that. You couldn't interrupt that, out, that outing if you wanted to. I mean, I, I, a bull couldn't have interrupted that yesterday. We had our minds set on parting. And, and, of course, I knew he would be welcome because I've been in your home. I've seen you welcome other people in your home. I said, just come go with us. He said, are you sure it's okay? I said, I'm absolutely sure it's okay. So RT, who's just passing through, comes in, and he, he makes a plate of food. I'm going to tell him, RT, you're going to watch this. I'm going, I'm going to get in trouble next week when I see you. Amen. But he made a plate of food. I mean, and, and I like going to your house with them oval plates. Amen. Those are straight from the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> them big ones like that. Not that little white plate that flops all over your hand. Don't, that's a, get, get thee behind me. Amen. <laughs> Y'all know them little old cheap white plates. I don't even want to go there. Amen. But they had them big Texas plates, ovals, man. I mean, you, you know, the five-pounders. They hold five pounds of food. And, and if you're real good, you can stack seven pounds on there. And RT had, had done a good job. And he sat down and we started eating. He goes, my God, I, this is awesome. I got here at the right time, didn't I? Man, this is good. I got here at the right time. He said, every time I come around, y'all, y'all are having a party. Y'all are eating. Y'all are having a good time. He said, I just like being around y'all. Hey, I'm telling you the truth. Strangers like being around Christians who are having a good time. Now, he's a Christian. Don't get me wrong. But guests, you can bring. And that's what they would do. These first apostolic century church uh, families would gather together in their homes. It'd be like your house ain't tiny. Anytime there was food, you'd just, just come on in, sit down, get another scoop of mashed potatoes. Come on, come on, sit down and eat with us. And, and they would bring these people into their, I'm going to use a Greek word, into their oikos into their fellowship their small group their their home group and in that they would just be sitting there eating the good food and somebody would say boy God's been good this week hadn't he oh yes he has man God's been great dude. God's been doing this or somebody would say you know what I got a bad report from the doctor this week and next week we're going to have to do they're going to have to do surgery now I'm making it applicable to our time they might say uh, that I've got something going on in my life that I can't deal with by myself and you know what the, 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 they would do in that? That wouldn't shut the party down. Never shuts the party down when somebody has a need. Well, I come here and I got a need and I don't want to, everybody's having a good time. I don't want to be the, the one that should. You can't shut that kind of party down. You cannot shut it down. You know what happens if you make your need known a bunch of, around a bunch of apostolic Pentecostals? They'll just say, they'll, they might put their fork down. They might not. Might just change hands with it. Amen. Well, let's just say they'll put their fork down. We got good-mannered Pentecostals right about now, apostolics, okay? And they'll put their fork down and they say, man, I'm sorry to hear that, that you're going to have a surgery next week. I'm sorry to hear that you're facing something that you can't go through by yourself. Well, let me just tell you something. You're not going through it by yourself. 
because we're going to go through it with you. We're going to be at the doctor's off with you. We're going to be at the courthouse with you. We're going to be, come on somebody, we're going to do life with you. We're going to eat our meat with gladness. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We serve a God that is able to change reality and change circumstances and take things that are not uh, and call them as though they were. And if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Visitor, if you don't mind, neighbor, we'd like to join hands with you laying on of hands. Uh, and we'd like to pray a prayer of faith. Uh, and we'd like to give our God an opportunity to manifest himself to show up and show out in your problem. I'm talking about why they existed and why we exist. Why does this church exist? So we can have a 501c3 nonprofit corp make money, this or that? No, this is a non making money church. Uh, we give it all away. Amen. You give it to us, we give it out. Amen. We send it away. This is not a business. Uh, this is not anything else. We're not doing it just so we can have fancy lights and fancy pews and all of that. We are here uh, to lift up the name of Jesus in this building uh, so that we can train you uh, and inspire you uh, to go to your homes uh, and welcome your friends and neighbors in and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist, to create an apostolic environment through the Word of God and through worship. Amen. And we exist, amen, to come into these meetings. Paul would write later to the Hebrew church in chapter 10 in verse 24. He said, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. If you don't mind, I would like to read this in the New Living Translation and, and hear how it sounds uh, with that one also. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to do acts of love and good works. Would you say that with me? Let us... Think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meetings together. Everybody our say our meeting together, as some people do. Let us not neglect our meetings together. Now, what meeting is, he, meeting is he talking about? When the church comes together, whether it's in the temple ministry or it's in the house-to-house -house ministry. Whether, and there are times, amen, that you cannot get to the house of God. There are times, whether it's, it's physical restraints, job restraints, those kind of things. But I'm speaking to you in the Holy Ghost, and I speak to a spirit of the age. I'll pause for effect. Shouldn't tell you I'm doing that, but that's what I'm doing. If you can get to the house of God, you better get there. Because there is coming a day, probably in the near future, they almost did it with the pandemic. And they're going to try it again, where they shut the church house down. Now, they've been dealing with this around the world for years and centuries, where church does not have the freedom of religion. But in the United States of America, probably in the near future, you're going to see the devil try to do it again where you cannot go to church or where they try to censor you online. So I say unto you again, when you have the opportunity, you ought to do everything in your power, everything in your ability to get into this building on Sunday morning. You should do everything in your power to get here. I want to say this to those of you that love Jesus in your jammies. That's the ones that are watching out there right now. My wife and I was in a restaurant here oh, a few months back. We were having a, a meal. And while we were having a meal after a Sunday service like this, we were eating our afternoon meal. You know how we Pentecostals like. We like to eat. Amen. So did they. The apostolic church liked to eat. And we were eating our meal. And in walked a couple. Amen. That wasn't at church. And they were there, and, and, and we said, hey, hey, how you doing? Missed you this morning. They said, oh, we were watching, we were worshiping from home. We love Jesus in our jammies. 
I want to say this and say it loud and say it clear and say it plain. I thank God for the media ministry. And I don't know how we would have made it through the pandemic without you, Sister Anna, without you, Brother Marcos. I don't know how we would have made it. I really don't. I thank God for you. But the media ministry is no substitute, not biblically a substitute, or not physically a substitute, or not emotionally a substitute for coming together. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Forsake, I'm going to preach it until you get it, till you get with me. Amen. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That means you got to come together. That doesn't mean watching from home when you can get to the house. Uh, I thank God that this message is going around the world because of the tool of online media. But that does not replace uh, coming together with my brothers and sisters. Uh, it does not replace the laying on of hands. Uh, and if we're going to be an apostolic church, uh, we got to be apostolic. And the apostles met together. They met on Sunday. Then they met in their homes throughout the week. Does that mean i got to have a party at my house every week? Brother Andy, you'd go broke. Glenn, you'd go broke having to pay for all what y'all had to pay. You'd go broke. Your parents would go broke paying for a party like you had the other day. Amen. Amen. You, that doesn't mean you got to have somebody in your house every week. It means it was their weekly practice. It was the way they lived their life. Amen. That as they did life, they did it with each other. They did life in these small uh, home groups, in these oikoses. I think I, I'm, got, I'm going long, and I've got I to get in a hurry because I feel the spirit of my wife coming upon me. <laughs> or that little short stick ruler she carries around. No. Amen. I thank God for these small groups during the pandemic because there's no way that one pastor can go and minister to all the needs of the people in a church this size. Amen. There's, it's impossible. It's impossible for me to go around checking on everybody. We did what we could, and we did a lot. Amen. We stayed on the phone from, day, from daylight to dark trying to help people and get people and, and help get stuff and help get medicine and all of that kind of stuff that you do during hard times. But we didn't do it. We, it, we could not have done it. But thanks be unto the Lord, your oikoses, your little home groups, your small groups, you took care of each other. You watched after each other. And most time it sounded like this. Hey, Brother Sharp, so-and-so had this problem but don't worry we already got it taken care of we've already fixed the need we've already followed through with it that's the way the church is supposed to work oh my god i gotta go on and they continued amen together in their houses he said let us consider one another let us think of ways to motivate one another to do acts of love everybody say acts of love and acts of good work acts of love and acts of good works. Why do we exist? We exist to do acts of love. What's an act of love? Picking up the phone and calling somebody. Amen. Saying, hey man, I had you on my heart. If, if the Lord ever moves on you to call me, don't, I, I, I rebuke the spirit of, of, of your flesh and of the devil. If the Lord ever removes, uh, moves on your heart that you laid, laid me or my wife on your heart, Amen. And why don't you just pick up the phone? Well, he's the pastor. He really, he's got a lot going on. And all of that's correct. But my God, if God's moving on you to pray for me or you got a word for me, if, you, if I can't answer the phone because I'm on the phone with somebody else, text it to me. I want to hear it. I need to hear it. I need to hear it from you. And if the Lord moves on you to call somebody else, pick up the phone and call them. Go do an act, do a, an act of kindness, an act of love. Yeah, I can't explain it, but I just, I, I, I just feel like I need to do this for somebody. Amen. And when you do it, amen. Your acts of love and your good deeds are going to be seen by this world. And he said, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another. Everybody say encourage one another. Now, I don't want to preach the word exhort. I could. 
amen, maybe Pastor Tim will follow up or somebody, one of the other ministers will follow up on it this week. I could talk about exhorting. Exhorting is not just saying, hey, good job, do a better job, do this. Exhorting is to promote someone to do good and to make sure they get it done, to keep helping them along the way. It's like uh, teaching your kid to ride with no training wheels. You hold on for a little while, you know, and then all of a sudden you hold on a little bit more and then you run a little faster and then finally you can turn loose. When you're exhorting your brother or your sister, it's not saying, well, you shouldn't have done that. That was dumb. That ain't exhorting somebody. That's tearing somebody down. You see somebody that's made a mistake or somebody that's going through something, you say, hey, Bo, I, I, I've been through some rough stuff myself. Let me see if I can help you. Let me see what I can do. Let me encourage you. Amen. This is, come on. Amen. That's fine. This is what an apostolic church does. I'm talking about, all I'm preaching about is the why. Why we exist. And it's to do these acts of good works and these works of love. And it's the matter of some is, but exhort one another in so much as you see the day approaching. Can you say amen? Praise God. The second reason we exist is, you hear it, and this is the DNA of this church. If you don't know this, you need to learn this. Everybody that's been here a while knows CC2C, connecting Christ to our community. Everybody say it with me, connecting Christ to our community. Not only do we have a responsibility to build an environment in this place on Sundays, that the, an apostolic environment on this, in this place, and not only do you have a responsibility to build an apostolic environment in your home that anybody that comes into this place or comes into your home feels the power of the Holy Ghost, but in addition to that, we have a responsibility to take the power of God out of this place. I'm not going to re-preach this, because if you've been around here more than 15 minutes, you know this is how we live our life. It ain't about everybody coming into this place to get Christ. It's about we come in here and lift up Christ, the Holy Ghost falls, and then we take Christ back out to our jobs, to our neighborhoods, to our families, to our oikoses. We take Christ back out of here in our lives. Amen. It's too many churches are centralized around a building, a pulpit, a pew, a steeple, and bringing the people in. Yes, we must assemble together. But the church does not, is not an inward-focused church. The church must be an outward-focused church. Jesus gave the Great Commission, and Matthew recorded it in the 28th chapter and the 18th verse. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and make Disciples, Is that up behind me? I'm in, not in the King James. I'm in the New Living Translation, I believe. Go and make disciples. Everybody say, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Everybody say, go and make disciples. Well, preacher, that means you got to go. Yes, I got to go, but not because I'm a preacher. It's because I'm a member of the church. He's not speaking to the ecclesia here. He's not just telling the pastor to go and make disciples and, or, or to come up with some system at the church on Sunday or Wednesday night in which you have a class called New Converts or New Life. Or, all of those are great tools. But what he's telling you, everybody say he's telling me, is I have a responsibility to go and make disciples. You have a responsibility to duplicate your life and your uh, relationship with the Lord with someone else. And this is how the Lord adds to the church daily. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I could spend some time here, but I won't. But the name, I, because you know it well, and we're in an apostolic Pentecostal church, we know that straightway after this commission, we see them baptizing in the second chapter of Acts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. The angel told Mary, you shall have a child. He's going to be the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sins of the world. And he's going to be the Son of God. And his name shall be called Jesus. And Jesus said, I must go away that I can send the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Ghost. And I will send that comforter in my name, which is the name of Jesus. So when we baptize you in that baptistry there in the name of Jesus, you calling on the name of Jesus, you are recognizing that 
that God who is a spirit dwelt in the man Christ Jesus who died for our sins. He ascended into glory but left that some of that sent some of that spirit back down for us the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost for us to be filled with and all of that happens in one name which is the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? If you do say amen. He said go and baptize and the 20th verse says teach these new disciples. Who is to teach them? Pastor, you're to teach them. No, you are to teach them. When Mike and April came here, April, raise your hand. Mike's in the back. They came here, amen, to this church. I took them over and introduced them to this couple. Raise your hand, brother, sister, Wicker Green. Amen. And I said, you're it. See if, see if you can bring these uh, this couple, we, we felt that God was calling you to this church. We felt that, Mike. We felt that, April. We felt that you were going to be a part of this church. And, and uh, pastor cannot take uh, all of the new visitors in and, and say, okay, come over to my house tonight. Come this and come that. And I didn't give you a pamphlet, I don't think. And I didn't give you a program. Did I, give, I didn't give you nothing, did I? I just said, these are great people. Amen. Take them under your wing. Introduce them to the church. Introduce them to who we are. And looky here, looky, looky here, looky here. Amen. God is good. Mike's our men's director. Amen. We're so thankful for that. You see, amen, amen. That's right. Amen. That's how it's supposed to work. Amen. That we are supposed to disciple. We are supposed to teach. You say, well, I'm not a teacher. Sure you are. Sure you are. I watch my wife teach my grandson how to brush his teeth. You're a teacher. You taught your kid how to ride a bike. You teach somebody else at work. You teach somebody else how to do it. You're a teacher. Teach them what you know. Say, well, I don't know much. Well, then teach them a lot of what you know. And for God's sake, don't try to teach them something you don't know. That's where you make a mistake. Pastor Tim, I love telling the story. You knew I was going there, didn't you? I looked at you and saw you. Hey, man, he was, he was a new pastor here 27 years ago, whatever it was. I don't keep up with time that much. Hey, Amen. And he came here, and, and he was intimidated. I said, you're going to preach this next service. And he goes, oh, no, Lord. Oh, no, no. Okay. Oh. Now, this is before he had kids and, and everything else. He was nervous. He was so scared. He wouldn't even lay hands on a five-year-old. He would, I mean, literally, he would just want to speak the word, you know. He, I literally had to take him out of youth camp and take his hand and put it on a five-year-old kid, amen, or eight-year-old, whatever old that kid was at, at a, a crusader camp, put his hand on the head, and as soon as he laid his hand on the head, the kid started speaking in tongues. I said, see, that's how it's done, amen. He was nervous. He said, Pastor, I, I, I don't know the Bible. I hadn't, I've read it, but I, I don't know it all, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm scared to preach. I said, it's easy. I said, he said, how's that? I said, just preach what you know. He said, well, I don't know all of it. I said, well, then just preach what you know. Find a subject, amen, and I don't know if it was love or whatever. I gave him some illustration. I said, just read everything in the Bible about love and preach on love. If you've got to preach on love for the next three months till you learn something else, preach whatever when you learn it, amen. And, and that's how he started preaching. And, and you don't have to preach stuff you don't know. Do you know most of the people in the first century church were illiterate? They could not read or write? You know they didn't have a Bible? For hundreds of years, they didn't have compiled a uh, Bible like you and I have for hundreds of years after the church. So it wasn't like you could go down to the bookstore and buy them a Bible. You know what they did? They just told them what Jesus had done for them. That's the good news. Amen. That's the gospel. I was on the road and I met a man named Jesus and he spoke to me. And man, all here am I. Amen. They told their story. And you can teach what God has done for you. This is why we exist. To connect Christ to our community. If you're waiting for this church to get a program, God, I'm getting long-winded. And I thought this was going to be a short one. I spent $2,200 as a young pastor of your money on a Friends Day program. The manual is probably 25 years old, but I won't let them throw it away because <laughs> it cost us so much money. And basically... I could have done the same thing if I'd have just wouldn't been so young and naive and all of that and just said, hey, why don't you go out and find every friend that you have and try to bring them to church? It was a program. 
And it worked. We filled the building up. Every seat in the house was full. Amen. It was fun. But it wasn't really apostolic. It was just a program. We paid a lot of money for that program. And I think that week that we pulled all that off, we had almost 500 in the building. The building seats about 500 people, 504. And almost every seat was full in the building. That Sunday that we had Friends Day, you have a roll-up and a roll-out and all of that. And it was great. And it was a lot of fanfare. And we had almost 500 that Sunday. And the next Sunday, we probably had 180. Because that's not the way the apostolic church is supposed to. You don't, you don't have to have 2,200 bucks to buy a manual to be apostolic. You just got to get in in, in, in in your heart as a member of, of the church of God and say, hey, it's my responsibility to share Jesus Christ. It's the best news in town. By the way, uh, they, I heard, did anybody else hear that gasoline's $1.99 at the, at the Shepco uh, on 25th Street up here? The, uh, I got your attention, didn't I? That's good news. Some of you wouldn't let me finish my sermon. You'd be lining up every car you got and them red tanks be tied on the, in the back of your truck. Jesus Christ. Hey, I was a drug addict selling dope to your kids and Jesus found me. Amen. I was a freshman at Texas A&M going to hell and Jesus interrupted me and he saved me and he filled me with the Holy Ghost. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh my God. If you can't tell somebody that, you need to come to an altar and pray through until you get something from God. That's what the good news sounds like. I, I was lost, uh, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was bound, but now I'm free. In Jesus' name, I feel my helper. Teach them to obey the Word of God, the commandments I've given you, and be sure of this, that I'm always with you, even to the end of the way. And final point I make today of why we exist we not only exist to create an apostolic environment through word and worship. We not only exist to connect Christ to our community by realizing that my relationship with Christ is about others and not about myself, but we, we, we realize also that the reason we exist is to create an apostolic culture. Everybody say an apostolic culture. If you were here at the beginning of the year, you heard me preach four weeks in a row on apostolic culture. If you weren't, just get on YouTube. Just look up apostolic culture. Start at one, go to two, go to three, go to four. If you're a member of TCC and you hadn't done that, you need to do that. That's from your pastor. I'm the man of God over you. The Bible, I don't do this often. The Bible said, Obey them that rule over you, for they watch for your soul as one that's going to give an account for God. If you have not watched that series, go watch that series on YouTube. If you don't know what YouTube is, see the Media Center. So I'm not going to preach, uh, 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 re-preach apostolic culture. I'm not going to. But I'm telling you that God has he's just eat my spirit up with this apostolic culture. I, I'm, oh, God. My wife don't like when I talk like this. But I'm getting older. And, and when you get, I don't know, maybe it happens to women and they just don't talk about it. But when, when you get almost 60, and I'm almost 60. My wife says, oh, you're a year away from 60. I know, but 60's on the horizon, and, I, and, and 60 has got my attention. I, it got my attention. And actually, I was starting to look at 60 when I was 58. And, and I'm 58 now. I'll be 59 in July. And, and, and so I started looking at 60, and I thought, man, that's a strange number because 70 is the next one. And 70's dead, man. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was almost 300 pounds. I'm not kidding you. Listen to me about myself, not about you. Some of you that are over 70, you're my hero. Amen. You that my father-in-law is 83, he is really my hero. Amen. And he still got black hair and, and good knees. Amen. Well, he, he told me his knees finally gave out. Amen. Told me that yesterday. Amen. But at 80, I mean, you're my hero. But I, I'm looking at the last few years of my life. 
Now, you may not be looking at your life like that, but in, in the last few years of my ministry, and, 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 and I want to have at least an effective and relevant and relative ministry till I'm 70 years old. I mean, after that, you just, you just put up with a preacher just talking about his grandkids. Some of y'all been in church a while, had you? God love him, bless his heart. Brother so-and-so, wasn't he sweet this morning? You get over 70, you got to watch out or you get that said about you. That's okay. They are sweet. And we love them. And we're going to keep bringing those elder ministers in here. And there's some of them sharper than I am. And they're 77, 78, 81, 82. We're going to keep bringing them in here. We love them to death. But it made me start looking at myself. And what am I going to be doing with the next 12 years of my life when I'm 58? I start looking at how am I going to, what's the church going to do? What's it going to look like when I transition from being the first line preacher or the lead pastor to the second or the elder or the bishop or whatever you want to call of this church? I start looking at my personal life, what I want to do in my finances, what am I doing in my children my grandchildren I start reflecting like that because when we we start living our life uh, for what is beyond us what is going if Jesus does not come and I cannot possibly understand how he has not come already I I see everything in the Bible we are living in the pages of our Bible which tells us these are the end of days uh, and this is the last times and last of times we are living in that hour but if Jesus chooses to tarry beyond my life uh, beyond the life of this pastor when I uh, step back and somebody steps in if Jesus chooses to tarry I want there to be an apostolic culture in this church uh, that will not die uh, that will not quit uh, and will go beyond my life uh, and into the life beyond uh, I don't care if it's an organizational culture organizations can change uh, I love the organization I'm not going anywhere they can't throw me out they better not try amen and I am a part of an organization that I love but I'm not trying to build an organizational church uh, I'm trying to build an apostolic church uh, that when I'm dead and gone uh, it still preaches, uh, teaches and believes uh, the same thing that we've always believed. I love our traditions. I love our church culture. I love our Texas culture and I love our even our new California culture friends. <laughs> Got to get your shots in while you can. If we were moving to California you'd do the same thing. I love it, but I'm not trying to build a Texas church. That's why I'm thankful, Sister Eubanks, you're here from California. I'm thankful. Amen. I'm thankful you're here from California. I thank you you're here from California. I'm thankful the two families we had last week here from California deciding to go. To, I'm thankful for it. Amen. Because I'm not trying to build a Texas church. And I'm not trying to build a California church. And I, all that junk is just crazy. What we need is to go back to what the first church did and have an apostolic church it needs to be just like it was in the word of the Lord and we need to understand that it's our responsibility to be the salt and the light Jesus said it like this Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 put it up so I can close amen you are the salt of the earth but what makes uh, what but excuse me what good is salt if it has lost its flavor and can you say, can you make it salty again? When salt has lost its flavor or savor, it cannot be made salty again. He said, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Let me preach about salt. Salt is supposed to affect everything it touches. And nothing affects salt. Pepper cannot hold its head up to salt. You can put more pepper, but it's still going to be salty. You can, put, you can cover it in jalapenos. But if you got too much salt, you can't make it less salty. If you get too much salt on it, amen, you can't unsalt it. Amen. If you, oh, come on, help me, I'm preaching now. Amen. If when salt is put on meat, uh, it will cure meat. Uh, meat left alone will rot if left in the sun. But you can even take an old piece of pig. That's called a ham, by the way. Amen. And you can take a piece of pig and you can roll it and wrap it in salt. Huh? And you can hang it without refrigeration in the barn. And that salt will be able to penetrate the flesh of that hog. Uh, get down to where the parasites live. Kill them and cure that 
pig so that you love your ham sandwich. I'm telling you, salt affects everything that it touches and nothing affects it. But if the salt has no saltiness, Jesus, help me today. If the church is just the church, God have mercy. We're spoiled. You're spoiled rotten in this church. Not because I pastor it. That's just something you put up with. Amen. But you're spoiled rotten in this church because the Spirit of the Holy Ghost moves in every one of our services. Many of you don't travel to other churches like I do. And many of us don't travel like the way our evangelists travel. But I, I had Brother Randall in my house for, for two weeks. Uh, and he would just come home every night and just say, My God, I love preaching at your church. My God, I love preaching at TCC. My God, the Holy Ghost was flowing tonight. He, and and that, that's the wow word, the last sermon. The wow continues. It, it's just going, you know why? Because we experience a move of the Holy Ghost. Every single service, the Holy Ghost is flowing. But that's not the way it is everywhere. Some places you go and it's cold, dead, and dry. And you just can't wait to get out, punch a clock, and go home. Amen. I'm done, done my thing, and I'm out of here. My friends, that is not an apostolic church. That church has lost its saltiness. There's two ways, and I can't go much longer, two ways for a church to lose its saltiness. It's getting the ditch on the right-hand side or getting the ditch on the left-hand side. If you get in the ditch on the right hand, you're a Pharisee, and you're judgmental, and everybody's going to hell but you, us four and no more, and you got to do this, this, and this, or you're no good. And you go into that ditch, you're going to be dead. You're going to go to hell. The Pharisees and the judgmental are going to go to hell, or you, get in the, and you, or you certainly aren't salty. Nobody wants to touch you or taste you when you're like that. Then you get over here in this ditch, and they believe anything goes. You got people swapping husbands and wives and husbands and husbands in churches and still preaching in pulpits. I'm telling you the truth. Don't make me slow down to preach to you. You got all kinds of stuff. They speak in tongues on Sunday, blah, 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 and go and do all manner of sin. And don't make me preach it. The kids are out of here, and I feel my helper. I could get plain. I'm on committees. I know things. My wife's saying no. Remember, I'm online. I know things about churches. And you can drag it to the floor, put it up to the neck, and run it down to your... You can have a white shirt on, so white, it turns blue. Some of them don't even get that. You can have... That ain't going to save you. And you can be so liberal that you don't believe fat meets greasy. Anything goes. You can believe anything. Oh, me and Jesus got our own thing going. That ditch will send you to hell. I don't want a conservative church, and I don't want a liberal church. I want an apostolic church, and we've got to have an apostolic culture. I don't want to lose our saltiness because I fall in love with culture or I fall in love with tradition, and I don't want to lose my saltiness because I fall in love with the world. I, I got to fall in love with Jesus, I, and I got to get up and say, I want to be what you want me to be. Let's stand right now. Come on, stand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I feel my helper in the house right now. Mm. Ha! Pardon me, my Holy Ghost is showing. Amen. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, ha, ha. I hope I'm doing a good God, job, God. Amen. I hope I'm doing a good job. Amen. I'm working for him this morning. I ain't working for you. I'm preaching for him, not for you. I'm just preaching. You're listening. Amen. I'm telling you what he told me to tell you. He told me to take you on this journey and tell you, don't ever lose your saltiness. The world needs you. The world needs you. You're the only hope the world has. Not just a preacher preaching online, but you live in your life in such a way, a balanced way, that it affects people that you come in contact with. They say, what meaneth this? How come, what's going on? He said, you are the salt of the earth. And then the 14th verse said, you are the light of the world. God have mercy. I love you folks that I dedicated your children today unto God. I love you, and you can't imagine how much pastor prays for you. I thank God that my boys are grown, and I thank God that one of them's gone.
told my wife the other day, I said, we did our job. We were having a bad day. I said, we got our job done with one. We got one of them to heaven. That sermon I preached the other day on Mother's Day, the greatest gift you can give your mother is to tell mom I'm going to heaven. That's the greatest gift this woman ever got was to know that one of her boys is in heaven. We and Jesus are still working on the other one in there. He's a good boy. He's a good man. He's not a boy. He's always going to be my boy. It's always going to be her baby. But he's a good man. And we're trying to get him and Tracy and Waylon to heaven. That's grandparents trying to maybe doing too much. We need to get out of the way sometime. But we're trying to get him to heaven. What good is it if we gain the whole world and we lose our soul, lose our children, lose our family? What good is it? in this dark, dark world that you're going to be required to raise your children in. It's a dark place. It's a horrible place. I'm not trying to depress you. But just in my lifetime, it's gone from crazy. I lived in the civil rights years and I saw race wars when they were race wars. Instead of just social media campaigns, I, I saw it for real and we got through all of that. I thought, praise God, and, and we're getting better and we love each other better and we were growing better. And then all of a sudden, this whole thing blows up again and the world's coming apart and the Russians and the Ukrainians and this and that and the pandemics and the Chinese and, and all this and fighting against that and corruption in high places. And it's a dark world. There's so much to get depressed about. There's so much to tear you down. It needs the light. It needs the light. It needs the light. And Jesus did not leave this world in darkness. He did not leave it alone. But He said, i got to go away, but I'm going to send another comforter. It's the promise of the Father. And that promise is the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Ghost is not some flame that you see floating around on my head and comes uh, into your job or your neighborhood or your home. There's not some glowing light that dances around in some mystical sense. But the Holy Spirit of God gets in us. The Bible said you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. It gets in us and sets us on fire. It burns out the flesh in us when we let the Holy Ghost flow through us. The things that I used to love, I no longer love. And the things I used to hate, I no longer hate. It switches your views to the views of Jesus Christ. You become a light in a dark world. If you'll lend your members to the Holy Spirit of God, if you'll lend your members, you'll start saying stuff that you didn't come up with. Somebody will have a conflict and you'll just open your mouth. And when you open your mouth, the Holy Ghost will fill it. And you'll say something, they'll go, could you say that again? That was amazing. And for just a half a second, you'll have to think, what did I say? Happens to me all the time. I, I'm not that smart. I'm not that wise. I'm, it, it's not the wisdom of Carrie Sharp that leads this church. It is the unction of the Holy Spirit as I let it flow through me. And I'm not special. You say, well, I got hang-ups and I got hiccups and I got problems. And, and I'm not like you, preacher. I, got, I live in the real world. Oh, give me a break. We all live in the real world. He doesn't dwell in a preacher because I stand in a pulpit. He dwells in me because I say, God, here am I. With all my faults and all my inconsistencies and everything that I am, I'm just yours, God. And if you will surrender yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll flow into you and He'll flow through you and He'll flow out of you. You'll be a light in a very dark world. He said, you are a light. You are the light of the world. You are like a city set on a hilltop that cannot be hidden said no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket but instead a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house and in the same way let your good deeds everybody say good deeds let your good deeds everybody say deeds be unto thee healed. Let me speak a word. Yea, I say unto thee. Everybody wants to spiritualize and super spiritualize and float off the ground. Why don't you just go help somebody? Because God put it on your heart. 
You don't have to be, you don't have to be floating. That's it. Thank you. You don't have to be floating off the ground in some spiritual uh, stratosphere up here. All you got to do is be willing to say, God, my time is yours. Hear me, church. Thank you, Anna, for giving your talent to the Lord. We found you before the world did, by the way. We found you. We found you before you were a graphic designer, before you had a position, before you were somebody. Amen. We found your talent that God gave you, but you know how we found you, Anna? Because you gave it to Jesus. You said, I'm available. What I got is yours. Uh, you started working back there in that media center and you, you let Taylor help you and some of the others help you and they begin to pull out of you your talent. We need your talent. We need your talent. The world needs your talent. You're good for something. You're good at something. Every single one of you are made for a purpose. We need your time because talent without time is worthless. Oh yeah, I know how to do that. But I just don't have time. Yeah, I can help you with that. But you know, I'll have to get back with you. I, I, you know, I, I, no, 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 no. Availability is the first thing the Lord needs from you. Here am I. Would anybody just say that to the Lord right now? Here am I. Here am I. Somebody say it with me. I'm not my own. Oh, you may have drove yourself here this morning. You may call yourself. I feel my helper. Don't, don't release yourself just yet. You may have drove yourself here in your own car and you may think yourself grown, but I'm telling you, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You didn't wake yourself up this morning. His breath is in your lungs. Uh, he said, if I would move my breath from your lungs, you will return to the dirt from which you came. I'm preaching to somebody in the Holy Ghost. You don't belong to you. You may think you do, but you don't. You may think you belong to God, but you don't. You belong to Him. And when you recognize that, when you say, Lord, I'm yours. My time is yours. Because all I have is the time you give me. Right now, with the Holy Ghost beginning to move here, God, my time is yours. Why do I exist? Why am I preaching? Why are we in this building? My time is yours, God. My talent is yours, God. You made me. You made me, God, with gifts and talents. You made me, God, this way. And my talent is yours. And God, you blessed me. Somebody in this house that's been blessed by the Lord say, He's blessed me. Somebody in this house that's got abundance in your life. That means you have more than what you need. Such so sharp. We got more than what we need. Our full, our freezer's full. Gee, God, I've all coached I have treasures, God. I have abundance. God, my time is yours. My talent is yours. My treasure is yours, God. Oh, let the Holy Ghost move in this place. The reason we exist is to be the light to a lost and dark world. We will march through the They need you. 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 Your neighborhood needs you. We will carry Your workplace needs you. We will Thank you for coming. Amen. Others are coming. Mother, we will pray. Lift this is your service. The world needs you. We will march they need to see your good deeds. They need to see your love of God in action. Anybody else join us up here at the front? Anybody else say, I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. My time, my talent, my treasure. It all belongs to you. I'm yours. Step up, Sister Cynthia, minister of the Holy Ghost.
torch. We will lift high the flame. They we need you. 